gracious Lord, you are the one who has to open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives. We give you the praise and the honor that is due you as our Savior, Lord, and coming. So come here, open our hearts, O oh Lord. Work in us that which you desire. Cause us, Lord, to be drawn near to you in even deeper ways. Open our hearts, Jesus, to the presence of your Holy Spirit. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There's a show on television, commercial television, that my wife likes to watch. And I came into the bedroom one night and she said, I want you to see this. And she recorded it and backed it up. And it was the last maybe two minutes of the show called Bull. Um, and apparently, I don't, I don't know this about commercial television very much, but it's one of the most watched TV shows on television. Now, I need you to know, I don't typically go to commercial television if I'm looking for wisdom. Um, but actually, the end of this show is quite profound. Bull, as you may or may not know, is a psychologist who analyzes potential jury candidates. And out of that, the profile, he begins to work with attorneys to think about the best way to present a case appealing to the types of people who are on the jury. Actually, it's very clever. Well, at the end of the show, and this is all I saw, so I have no idea what preceded it. Well, psychologist is standing on the front steps of the courthouse in New York City, and beside him is a priest, and they're chatting. And he turns to the priest and he says, you're never alone, are you? The man got a little bit of a smile on his face. He said, No, I'm never alone. And then Bull said, I almost died in front of his cross. I had a heart attack. I was laid out on the steps, looking up at the blue sky. No one stopped. All I saw was blue sky. I didn't see angels or dead relatives coming to greet me. It's just empty. He said, I'm alone. So you're not alone, are you? And the priest said, No, no, I'm not alone. You don't have to be alone either, the priest said. The bull. The bull turned him down. In fact, the priest even teased him as he was walking away. You know you're going to hell though. <laughs> I was actually very surprised that he did that. <laughs> and it, it really struck me that in that 60 second exchange, I saw on television the essence of what it means to be released. Because you see, we walk as men and women who are called into this office in the companionship of God. And if we had had that, we wouldn't have had anyone. We would at best be a counselor, a social worker, a manager of people, none of which are actually bad, and skills are quite necessary at times. But that's not the heart of it at all. The heart of it is the promise of Jesus when he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And you have those moments in your life, just like Isaiah, where you are called, and not just called, but marked. Then one of the seraphs came with tongs and touched my lips with the tongs from the altar. Marked. And it's irrevocable. Once that mark happens in the very depths of your soul, you can never, ever lose it. There are times, Rob, there are times when you will wish it isn't there. 
when the responsibilities feel more than you want to actually have to handle. And then you hear the word of the gospel where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Like there are other shepherds and you don't want to be like them. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And you sigh. And you say, okay Lord, here we go. But the mark never leaves. But the good news is that the companionship never leaves either. There are times certainly when we feel it more than other times. In fact, the absence of the sense of the presence of God can often mean that he is most at work. It's all subterranean though. We're, we're, we're not conscious of it because sometimes the deepest works of God in our lives are in fact way underneath the radar. And then one day, in the midst of all of that, where you feel like you've just been in a desert, God has been entirely absent. Your prayers sort of hit the ceiling and fall on the ground again. At least that's what it feels like. It's never true, but that's what it feels like. And then all of a sudden you turn a corner, and you're not even conscious of the fact that the corner got turned. But boom, there's, there's water of life in there. The river of living water begins to flow again. And if you have any self-consciousness at all, you can tell the difference has happened. That underneath the sand and the rock and the gravel of the desert, the aquifer has been bubbling up. Because you're marked. Because it never goes away. You can't shape the companionship of Jesus. He's stronger than we are. He's stronger than we are. And because he is, he is utterly determined. Because he loves us so dearly. So dearly. To never forsake us. And in fact, sometimes against our best efforts, he chooses to work out things in and through us that we could never ever imagine. They're beyond anything that we could even begin to conceive. Or, or to think of. I, the clergy have heard me say this. There are times when I'm in a worship service or something else is going on and, and God is just moving and doing things. And, and I just go, how did I get in on this? <laughs> and then there are other times where you say the same thing only because you are in the midst of a place of sharing people's greatest sorrows. The most horrible times they are ever endured, and yet you still count it a privilege, a privilege to be there in those dark, dark places, so that they are never alone. But more importantly than that, it's never just the two of you, because Jesus is there. He's the one that takes the difficulty of that terrible, awful situation and begins to work something. Again, almost at a subterranean level, because the grief is too much to bear on us. In a way that eventually works something out that we could have never imagined. You see, it's, it really is, even though I speak to this as to my Protestant friend, it is mediation. You are giving that which you have received. And the way you grow in priesthood is to be the recipient of the priesthood of Christ. And the more you receive that, the more it's able to flow out of you. So that even beyond the borders of your own body, there is this presence <coughs> that God saturates you with, bigger than you are, because he's always bigger than you are. And then choosing at times to manifest it to show it, to make it known to the world. And sometimes you wish you would do that more often. And other times you want to just hide out. And he said, no, 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 you're not going to hide out. you got to step up. There are things I want to do here. Okay, Lord. Because you are under his authority. Under. Not beside. You are under. You are under his authority. So Rob, it is into this invitation, this invitation, quite frankly, to companionship 
and even to death and the resurrection into which you are called. Because the more you enter into the priesthood of Christ, the more a part of you actually begins to fall away. You, you thought it was great. You thought you were hot stuff. And all of a sudden that just begins to fritter away because it's just no longer necessary. It's a persona that you create, especially when you're a, a young adult and you want to be impressed. Right? <coughs> Who didn't go through that time in their life? You know how to drop just the right thing, drop in, you know how to say just the right thing to impress somebody else, you know how to put your best foot forward, you know how to make a good impression because you're trying to get ahead. But then something begins to happen in your life, at least that Jesus is going to be Lord, where you begin to look at that and say, that's so much like a 15 year old. I don't have to be 15 anymore. And you find a way just to let it go, or and in fact, to die. That doesn't mean it doesn't come back. All of us still have inside of us a little bit of a young kid that, that really wants to be liked, who wants to be impressive, and wants to do well. And God knows that. It causes him to smile. There's, there's no condemnation in it at all. But it is, in fact, an invitation to die. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And often that means a contentment to serve in places without a lot of notoriety. Very few people who will ever say thank you, at least not for the death of your sacrifice. Because they don't know. They will never understand fully what is being asked of you and what God is doing through you. Or the price you pay when nobody else is looking. God surely does. Just when you feel like you need a slight tap on the shoulder, it happens. He does this. To give you the encouragement you need to keep going away from the spot, but very much in the light of God. It is, at its heart, a profoundly sacrificial. It means living out that kind of sacrifice with a sense of poise, a sense of a desire to be useful, realizing it's what you signed up for. I mean, it could not be more specific than what we've heard. And that out of that grapefruit, some of which you see occasionally, much of which you know, for the kingdom begins to happen begins to manifest itself through you. So priesthood is an invitation to companionship. It is an invitation to sacrifice. But in the end, it's also an invitation to a profound intimacy. Intimacy with God himself. What happens when you close the door? When you go into that place, which is for you, your prayer closet, whatever that might look like. Where you commune with the one who knows you better than you know yourself. Where you're able to be still in his presence. Or so ramped up because of everything that's going on. All you can do is just talk. Get it out. He listens incredibly well. And it is out of that tenderness, that capacity to know that he hears you and that he receives you and that he loves you. Is that the mark and the tongs on the altar that touch the core of your heart is in fact not a curse but a blessing. That's important. Have you ever read Carson Zakis' book, The Last Temptation of Christ? The thing that he gets wrong in some very clear way is that the Jesus character in that book sees his calling as a curse instead of a blessing. Doesn't mean it's easy. But it is that which, in fact, feeds the deepest parts of who we are. So that laying down our lives, in fact, becomes, in some ways, actually a glad invitation to give in a way that somehow Jesus might be glorified in it and people might turn to him. Not that I get the notoriety, but rather that he does. And that's what we live for. 
Is that not right? That's what we live for. I mean, what we live for is for Jesus to be glorified. What we live for is to see lives changed for the gospel. What we live for is to see communities different because of the presence of people who love and who care and who sacrifice in a way that leaves others behind, in a way that sets a pace for others, that lays down their life for the people in their community. That's what this is really about. Because in the end, my brothers and sisters who are here listening to me, to me, those people who serve in priesthood are in fact called by God to set a pace so that we as a body can walk with them so that it's not just that Rob has great time below with God or he's serving people in the hospital or in those other places outside of the spotlight, but people begin to come together and the community of a pop up or wherever it is that God is going to place you actually begins to know of the people who care about each other and who are willing to express the love of Jesus publicly, sacrificially, in a way that causes people to go, what is going on in that church? <coughs> you see, it's not privatistic, even though it is intensely personal. In the end, it is actually quite public, even as the crucifixion of Jesus was. The sign that he is the Messiah, where he would be lifted up, that all would be drawn to him. Jesus says three times in this gospel reading, I lay down my life, because an invitation to see not just a private sense of personal sacrifice, as if somehow who we really are are quietists to hang out with other people who think like we are, but we don't get in trouble for it, or that nobody really notices. That's a betrayal of the gospel. But then instead we find a way to publicly walk together in a way that causes other people to see, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, the things which have been old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their protection by Him. It's Jesus, you see, He's doing it. Priesthood in the end is a rallying cry. It is a public stake in the ground it is a declaration to the world that the things of this world with which they are so enamored, position, education, money, entertainment, are in fact things that fall to the ground and become ashes, and that God is raising up in the midst of that a group of people who embody in the way they walk, talk, how they spend their money, how they live out their time for something that is bigger and greater that is in fact a foretaste of the world to come. And it is you and others who choose to lead the way in that call. It's actually the hardest part of the job. Because people will be happy to go to you for personal prayer if they trust you. But to lead them into the marketplace where the friends are watching, oh, that's and that's kind of terrifying. And it is also a part of who we are. We are not in any way called to hide out. Just the opposite. We are called to stand out and be different. And priesthood says, I'm in. Let's go. Stand up. So Robert, God has called you, you, to continue to feel the mark inside you even more deeply as the years progress. To know that the hot burning coal of the Holy Spirit that touched your heart left a scar in which the Holy Spirit just vibrates like a tune. He's a musician, you get that. <laughs> and that it is God's work within you to say yes to what he would have you do, though it is in fact a call both to sacrifice, but also to intimacy. In fact, they are two sides of the same coin. It is the sacrifice that leads to intimacy, and it is the intimacy that draws us to sacrifice. Friends, you can't have one without the other. Why? Because it's not pragmatistic. It is missionary. So be one who stands out who sets the pace, 
who lives out the gospel, not just quietly believes it. In a way that causes your community, wherever you serve, to know that God is up to something. And the rest of us need to be.